Hello, hello. Hi everybody, welcome to FYI. Thank you all so much for coming out here tonight. We're really thrilled to welcome you all here to our campus for this event with AI. My name is Sean Kandrowitz and I run the editorial here at FYI. And as I said, thank you, thank you. Uh, and we're really excited to be doing this. This is, you know, the latest in our series of events that we've been doing with AI LA. We're honored to be, you know, collaborating with you guys for these amazing events. And really to be like a neutral place to have these sort of discussions about AI. You know, like whether you're really excited or maybe you're a little nervous about some of the things going on in AI. You know, if I is a place that we can exchange ideas, have conversations, and learn. Let me tell you a little bit about FYI. FYI is a messenger tool for creative collaboration, and it's turbocharged by AI. You can use it to develop your own ideas, you can use it to collaborate with others, or to make public-facing presentations. And for all of those reasons, FYI is a pretty cool tool for educators. Uh, Renee, if you can pull up the project, I want to give a shout out, speaking of educators, to Julia Gonzalez, who teaches a course on making short form video content for social media and the curriculum and the media that she's been using for this uh, class is all on FRI as a project. So as you can see, she's got text, she's got um, her curriculum through photos as well as videos, and there's a chat where people can discuss, her students can discuss, and there's also um, other projects in there. So if you're putting together, you know, a syllabus, or you're putting together lots of different information that you want to present to your students, FYI is a great way to do so. Now, Yulia is going to be presenting this in a few places. You have some uh, collaborations coming up that uh, I'm really excited about. But she's also teaching this uh, online as well. So we will put a link for her class. Uh, in the chat, we're all in the project here, if you want to learn more. work. Um, and speaking of the project that you're all in, we're going to have an amazing panel tonight. And if anybody has questions for this panel, you can go to the project for this event and drop your question in the discussion. I see a lot of you have already been doing that. Um, you just go to the discussion tab at the top of the project and drop them in. I've already seen some great things there, and I know we're going to have some really intelligent and thought-provoking discourse here tonight. Um, amazing presentations, we got product demos back there. Uh, we're just really excited that you're here. So I just want to thank you again for all coming out. It's an honor to host this here, and I would like to pass the mic to the co-founder of FYI. Make some noise for Will I Am. Thanks everybody, thank you AILA for another awesome event. Thank you Julie for bringing people together. Um, right now we are living in awesome times. Um, it's a new industrial revolution. We all know the subject, but there's a lot of folks out there that are not aware of the awesomeness that is about to unfold. It's unfolding now, but remember we are in Pac-Man and the technology hasn't even reached Halo yet. Um, there's a lot of things that we need to inform ourselves on. We need to push for regulations without slowing down progress and innovation. Um, and next year is gonna be a very, very um, clumsy year with the presidential election right around the corner and technology to do us all. Um, and the more that we inform, the more prepared we will be for the duty. Um, so um, have a great discussion, learn, exchange ideas, exchange uh, concerns, and if you have answers to people's concerns, you know, engage in conversation so people walk out of here ready to inspire and still bring optimism because the technology and the engineers that are working in this field, some of them, a lot of them are the good guys, um, and but it's gonna take us all to spot out the bad guys and uh, hold them accountable. The technology is awesome, the time is amazing. And if you live in, the reason why I love it so much, and why I started FYI, if you live in an inner city where you've always been neglected, no 
investment for your education, no opportunities for your local folk. And you see people still cope together and, and come together and survive. It wasn't AI that caused people to live in those conditions. That was people. And now there's a tool for those folks that live in those communities that have always been ignored to solve their problems themselves. And as we have these jobs that will be toppled, the folks that are going to bring the industries of tomorrow are the folks from Compton, the folks from Mississippi, the folks from Louisiana, the folks from Chad, the folks from Uganda, the folks from you know, Nigeria. The, the jobs of tomorrow are going to come from the folks that have lived in areas where problems were never solved. And they're going to be solved with these technologies. So let's go. You're going to have to realize that. Seriously, a, a tremendous honor to be able to be here. My name is Taj Rouse, and I'm the founder and executive director of the AI Lake community. I started this seven years ago, and from humble beginnings, there's just a LA chatbot meetup group. And uh, we're bringing people together to talk about chatbots back when I was running a chatbot company. And uh, it's grown to where it is today, where we have over 12,000 people in our membership. And we have events like this talking about AI literacy. And we have another crazy amount of events that we're doing next month. Um, but all this would never be possible without amazing partners like FYI and Easy AI, um, who's actually lecturing our, our lecturing right now on YouTube, and you'll be able to see this later on YouTube. But uh, first and foremost, let's uh, give it up for Lawrence from Easy AI and talk a little bit more about what he's up to. I don't think I can be Will Speech, I'm not even try. But guys, what a time it is to be alive. I mean, I remember giving a speech, it was November, last day of November at University of Michigan, and I was telling the professors, I'm like, professors, watch out, because everybody's going to be doing AI on these next exams. And the next day, ChatGPT comes out. Literally the next day. And these professors had no idea, and I remember one of the faculty emailing me, like two weeks later, he's like, man, I know what you said it was true, but I didn't think it was going to be in two weeks that he's like three quarter of my students, I've never seen them write like this. And now they're writing like they're professionals. So what are we gonna do in this world where education is all about instilling these values, these fundamentals, and now it has to shift. It's like the great paradigm in education. And it's a, it's a really scary thing, but then it could be amazing. And if we look at the history of technology, Every time we were scared of technology, it ended up making our lives 10 times better. Every time people were scared of apps like Uber, now millions of Americans are making money of Uber. And that's what we believe here at Easy AI, is that if you're a small business, which is the majority of Americans, how can you automate so many of your tasks? Because you only got so much money, and you got so much to get done in so little time. And a lot of people are scared about AI replacing their jobs, but I swear to God, I've been implementing it in our company in every division, from HR to marketing to sales, and it's only making people faster, better, and adding more quality and value than they've ever had. And that's our mission at Easy AI. We're trying to help small businesses we're blessed to have a lot of awesome corporations that we work with, from Disney to Verizon. And all these executives have been messaging me these last six months, like, what the hell is going on with this? They're scared. But I think as the public starts adapting to AI, they're going to see the power of AI. And I know everybody here has already seen that. So it's going to be an amazing ride. But if you guys need help adopting AI, Call me and my team, we'd love to help you out. God bless. Thanks, Lawrence. I'd like to bring up one of our partners, Grace, uh, from New Leaf. So uh, Grace and I at AILA and New Leaf started a partnership where we were developing, we're developing this early, I always mess up the name of it. It's that AI Early Careers and Economy Report. Um, and so what we're doing right now is surveying about 50 different organizations to learn about their strategies around hiring uh, entry-level positions around AI. 
And the intention behind this is because we're developing a workforce development program called IDEAS. And IDEAS is going to be focusing on the community college system here in Los Angeles, where we're going to be developing a, our next cohort is going to be focusing on AI medicine, where students will be able to go through this program. Once they graduate, they'll have the opportunity to apply for a paid apprenticeship at Providence Health System. Um, and so it's a pretty amazing program. Right now we're working on this research, pro uh, research report so we have more data to really inform our decision making and how we scope this project and hopefully scale it across other different industries besides healthcare. And so, great. Hi everyone, my name is Grace Park. I'm the CEO and co-founder of New Leap. We're very excited to be working with AILA to launch this report at our Collective Voice Summit in October. And it's really to create leadership in our communities with our students and people with lived experiences. When you look at leadership today, the pathways are very difficult when you grow up in South LA, Bad Lines, or Goal Heights, right? So how do we create that navigation and mentorship? We work with leaders that look like each of you today to actually create purpose and impact together, to create jobs with attention, and to build skills that we can create together uh, on October 20th at USC this year. And what's great about the summit is we're actually going to launch the AI Early Careers and Economy Report with Todd, which has a lot of the data around how we should be hiring entry-level students and how to create the next generation of AI jobs across AI, tech, media, healthcare, and construction. So if you're in any of the spaces, you should join us, AILA, Lily, and FYI on October 20th at USC. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Now, let's get into the panel. So we've got an amazing uh, star set panel here that's really going to get into what we call, right, this whole event's called Pathways of Progress. And so we really want people to really have a better understanding of what AI literacy is, how it's going to be integrating within K-12, through community colleges, uh, uh, higher education, and also within the workforce. Because no matter what, right, AI is here, these no-code tools that are easy and accessible for all of us to really understand, but we can't keep our head in the sand. We have to really understand how to use these tools so that we're not displaced in this AI revolution. And so let me give a round of applause for our esteemed panel and Nadra Adra uh, to uh, moderate this panel. Thank you. Innovative research and leadership. 
She oversees a dynamic research lab dedicated to tackling complex machine learning challenges with a commitment to exploring uncharted territories in fundamental machine learning research. Before Cohere, Sarah was a research scientist at Google Brain. On the East Coast, we would say she's wick as smack. Her passion lies in translating research advancements into practical and accessible machine learning solutions that have a real world impact. Uh, she's uh, also the founder and volunteer executive director of Delta Analytics, a nonprofit organization. And she has a PhD in computer science from MILA, the Quebec Artificial Intelligence Institute. Is that all correct, Sarah? I mean, I'm just not convinced that you used a chat by love. I feel like this is almost too reliable. <laughs> it's pretty reliable. All uh, right, next we have Steven. Steven has provided his bio. I can't give ChatGPT any credit for this. Or can we? No? No. Steven Romkin is the co-founder and chief content officer at Tailspin, an enterprise software solutions company that leverages immersive technology to transform the way global workforces learn, work, and collaborate. At Tailspin, Steven leads strategy and operations across the company's marketing and content production units. He has more than 20 years of experience in innovative technology, Hollywood content production, and business leadership, thousands of hours of media prior to turning his focus on immersive content for training, promotional, and entertainment purposes to service the needs of Fortune 100 organizations, professional sports leagues, and more. Stephen received his Bachelor of Arts from Clark, and he has an MFA in film production from PU, Boston University. All right, last but definitely not least is my boss boss. So, Thomas Poon is the Executive Vice President and Provost of Loyola Marymount University, located right here in LA. With over six years of tenure at LMU, he oversees and collaborates with senior leaders in the various crucial aspects of higher education. And at LMU, he oversees student affairs, enrollment management, and academic affairs, including six colleges and Loyola Law School. Before LMU, he held positions at Pitzer College, um, part of the Claremont Colleges Consortium, where he was a senior associate dean of the faculty. And he was a tenured professor of chemistry in the WM Tech Science Department which is a joint program between Pitzer, Scripps, and Claremont McKenna. He's also written two chemistry textbooks in organic chemistry. He has a BS in chemistry from Fairfield and a PhD in organic chemistry from UCLA. Also, with a smile. So, anything you want to add? Uh, it was accurate, ChatGPT was accurate, but boring as all get out. <laughs> All right, well next time if it was a little bit more sparkly, what would you add? Uh, I play ukulele. He does. He just played on stage for all of our first year students coming to campus. It was so, so wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so ChatGPT also helped me come up with questions for this evening. You know, but of course I put in the prompts, so just, you know, I was part of it, right? Um, so we're going to start with sort of the foundational pieces. We want to talk about how educators can strike a balance between teaching foundational concepts about AI, such as principles and ethical considerations, also enabling students to actually utilize tools available in their daily life, and grasp more advanced technical aspects of the technology. And to add to that, we already have questions from the audience and questions that we're all talking about as educators and technologists. Um, how do we ensure that students still have critical and creative thinking, that they are doing things on their own and using ChatGPT or other generative AI tools or the things we can't even imagine that will be created in the future um, to enhance and embrace who they are as people and that we're not gonna just go into this dystopia um, so, we'll start there, foundational aspects. Anybody want to jump in? <laughs> I'll jump in. Great, thanks Tom. Yeah, so, uh, you know, one thing I would say is that AI is more than just growing, right? And so, we have to give students more opportunities, not just in their classes, utilize AI. There's so many opportunities on a college campus or high school or K-12, right? K-8. Um, 
you know, co-curricular activities. You can use AI, and, and students can be, you know, they can get ideas on how to plan events. Or uh, in their work, we, have, we employ, you know, over 200,000 hours of student, uh, student work. And there are so many departments that can benefit from AI at a university. Uh, and so, you know, you have to give them the practice, right? Because AI is a tool. It's a, it's a, it can be actually a simple tool to use, but just like any simple tool, you wouldn't just hand it to someone and expect them, you know, like a drill. A drill is a simple tool. You wouldn't hand it to someone and expect them to create a masterpiece, right, from the get-go. It takes practice. And so our responsibility as educators is to provide that practice for students at, at a foundational level. And then uh, the advanced applications and uses of it will come from that. I, I had something down there. Uh, I was talking with a buddy. Uh, I went to the UCLA teacher education program. And one of my buddies who's still in the class of teaching, Andy Simmons, uh, he, he noticed something with his high school students because a lot of them weren't really using ChatGPT in ways that were, to him, that interesting. And he's like, there's only a few kids here that can really cook with this. And I was like, okay, well, what, what is it about it? He's like, these kids already, they understand literature, they understand pop culture at a very high level. So they can make this tool do really interesting things. And you know, you still have to have a lot of knowledge of form, you know, to understand how to make ChatGPT or, or generative AI, especially um, like images, really interesting. I think the best uh, mid-journey and stable diffusion images I've seen are from artists who have a really nuanced understanding of like different periods and styles and like I want Bart Simpson but in the last style of Basquiat or something, you know. So you still have to, to know a lot of things about the world to really fully utilize these tools. I think that's it. Okay. Um, well, it's lovely to be here tonight, so thanks for the opening question. I, I think, I don't know, it feels like we're all here tonight because we don't know how we're meant to feel about AI and education. Or at least that's probably what makes this panel interesting, because if it was already integrated to give education, there probably wouldn't be as much to discuss. So I build these models. My lab builds the next generation models. So maybe my perspective is a bit more as a researcher, but I see in some ways like the recent breakthroughs have resulted in what I say is two patterns that could be positive or negative. One is that the cost of creating information is much lower, which is quite exciting in some ways. So like your ability to communicate quickly or to generate something, um, it, the threshold or effort required is much lower. That's also probably the reason we're here tonight where some people feel anxious about this. So because we're able to create a lot more quickly, we've kind of sprung a lot of this technology and how do we evaluate now? Because if it previously took you ages to write an essay and now it's immediate, in some ways our framework for learning has to change. I'm not as worried about that. Maybe we can have a fun discussion about this tonight. Like, who's more? I think that learning typically changes over time as new tools come in. But it is a lot of pressure on our educators for how to evaluate all of a sudden, given that this new tool is being used. The positive of information is that it also allows for a lot more iteration and creativity, which is, I think, what you're saying, which is this ability to pivot or create new ideas in a rapid way. For those concerned about the technology, I think one of the issues with this, and this was printed out by Will I Am with misinformation in elections, is that this text is indistinguishable between human and algorithm. That's, the, that's what has led to powerful tools. But it also means that something educators face is they can no longer use traditional evaluations because we cannot trace what has come from a model and what has come from the student. Some people say we can, some people may have heard of watermarking, it doesn't work, unfortunately. <laughs> I don't know if, uh, but a lot of people pin their hopes on that, but it still makes sense. So I think that's fun to talk about tonight, is my, what I would tease, and as we go into the next question, I think that this switch is inevitable. It's more like, how do we equip people? Education is about how do you equip young people for the future? And I think that critical to that is we have to change how we evaluate 
and we have to create entry points for people to feel comfortable and to educate users about how to use this. Stephen, you talked about a mindset shift and sort of the evolution of how we need to embrace this. I appreciate the softball uh, because I was like, how do I follow that? It was like PhDs everywhere. Um, and so when we were prepping for this uh, panel and I was able to chat with these folks, um, one of the things that we had discussed, which is something that we focus on um, on a daily basis, is training soft skills. Uh, yes, we don't call them soft skills anymore. Different folks call them different things, but the social, emotional, and cognitive skills that are uh, becoming a pretty big gap. Um, there's an excellent uh, commencement speech uh, by uh, Governor of Illinois Pritzker, who talked about uh, just a couple months ago, who talked about empathy and compassion being traits that uh, we have to really work through our biological instinct to actually have. It's not, those aren't natural things. And yet without them, we can't really think critically and effectively about how to govern or uh, the governance around things like AI. We really need to be thinking about this tool, about AI and all of these different exponential technologies that seem to be coming at an accelerated rate. We need to be thinking about them with ethical and moral implications, but with ideally without the dystopian reactive fears, because that actually would be lacking in critical thinking. And so it really does take a mindset shift, not just for AI, but for a lot of the ways in which a workforce needs to, uh, needs to really think about what it means to be reskilled in sort of a, a new age of human plus machine, supported by machine, not immediately go to reactive human against machine, or machine if we fail, machine against human. So I think, I think it, to your question, I think we need to be able to shift to a sort of exponential way of thinking and understand how all of these things begin, all of these different technologies begin to uh, affect various aspects of our lives. Education is a huge one. Joel, I'd like to talk with you a minute about um, sort of K through 12, being that you've been a teacher. We talked a little bit about the rate of change and how does education respond to external shocks and that we've seen this before and education evolved. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, first of all, is anybody here right now current K-12 educator? Okay, uh, first of all, thank you for all that you do. Everyone just give them a round of applause. It's the hardest, uh, most difficult, most impactful job that you can have. Um, I'm sure there's other ones, but uh, yeah, we appreciate you. Um, so uh, the question was, uh, has this happened before? And it actually has. So um, I don't know, I don't think any of you were around for this, but in 1957, uh, the Russians won Sputnik. So in 1958, uh, Eisenhower did the National Defense Education Act. He passed it immediately. And what it did was it took a bunch of uh, topics that you normally not see until you're an undergraduate mathematics major, and put them into second and third grade. Now, I know some of you, I'm 40, so I know a lot of you guys are probably my age, and we're probably wondering like, why you had to learn about sets, or commutative theory, or associative theory, or things of that nature uh, when you were in like the third grade, right? And then you just never saw them again, unless you majored in mathematics. And this is all because of Sputnik, and it was the US government saying, we need to do something about this, because clearly the Soviets are beating us. Um, so this, this happens over and over again uh, throughout U.S. history, and I think now we're, we're witnessing that external shock. And you see a lot of governments, uh, especially you know, China, China, Japan, Singapore, 
were really orienting their K-12 education towards um, you know, all of these skills that uh, people, people like Sarah have to use um, on a daily basis or to a much lesser extent me. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's best to just not worry about this too much, but we do need to be doing the work. I think the fact that there are K-12 educators here is amazing. I think, um, you know, I tend to think about AI as being comprised mostly of like math and computer science, but it's gonna take everybody learning about the technology to a certain level, because at, at the end of the day, there's a ton of linguistics in there, there's a ton of, you know, um, people who teach language arts, uh, um, a lot of concepts from philosophy, like symbolic logic, all of these things uh, create AI, and they touch everybody's subjects. Uh, science, you know, people are making all, you know, I think you guys have a lot of science branch now, right? And people are making breakthroughs in science and kind of like subverting the scientific method through AI. So everybody needs to learn about it, and, and part of it is about being in places like this, but you also need some support from your districts, right? Like, they need to come in and they need to say, uh, give you direction. So I know that the California Department of Ed has a guidance document coming out very soon, um, and that will hopefully give uh, local districts around here a little bit more of a direction in, in how to approach this in all, in all subjects, not just math and computer science. Tom, I saw you move a little bit there. I didn't know if the scientist in you was thinking about that scientific method comment. Any thoughts? I agree, yeah, I agree. Great, anybody else want to respond? I mean, I just say, I think we're talking about two different things. One is how do you build some, how do you train someone who will build the next generation of algorithms? The other is how do you educate with the presence of algorithms? And both of those are separate important questions. To train someone who builds algorithms, it's that actually, I think this is one of the most interesting times. People think of computer science as very like pervasive, how did it just happen. And it, in some ways, it's one of the most exciting fields because modern computer science history is 60 years. So it's literally one generation. And so I feel like it's so, uh, in some ways, such an exciting field for young people to come into because it's remade every 10 years. And it's so exciting because now the, you know, even something like coding, because you're doing it, uh, all my engineers on my team use Copilot or use augmentative tools, and they're really strong engineers. They train, they went, they got PhDs, they're researchers as well. But it's just the notion of how you create is moving faster. And the entry point is also changing, so more people can be involved in really impactful ways. So I would say one is exposure. So you know, if someone goes to who trains the next model, it's exposure early on. It's getting people excited because obviously there's only a small percentage that go all the way to the fully specialized. But I actually think that percentage as well is going to get bigger because the notion of who can participate is also changing. And that's what's so exciting about these tools. But there's a separate question, which I think is equally important for this panel is like there's a question of how do you just educate, whether that's for a biologist, whether that's for a chemist, in the presence of these tools. And that's equally important for educators because the question now becomes how do all the work I put into my rubrics and my evaluation, how does that have to change now that there's just by diffusion and adoption these tools everywhere? And I think that's equally interesting to tackle. And I think, Joe, what you were talking about is this one. But equally important is how, how do educators prepare their, how they evaluate learning because it's changed. Could I add to that? And oh, actually, good. and actually, I'd, I'd like to ask, ask: What about educating with the tools? So when the tools become integrated into uh, future learning platforms and curricula, to me that is uh, into what I do every day. That that is really where maybe we as a community, as a society, various cultures, that's when we start to uh, maybe gain back some of the ground we've lost in technology moving our days so fast. I, I would imagine a lot of people are very busy all day long and it never seems like it's going to stop. Um, and life is moving faster, 
commerce business, everything's going faster. How do we get that back? Well, some of these tools come into play. Perhaps that helps us in business. Now think about how that could be applied to the struggles that the teachers who need appreciation, but more than that, need resources to do more with less because they don't have the resources. So how does how does AI become an effective tool in education? I mean, I'm gonna pass, but maybe I'll say quickly. I would say my my bet is the following, and this has been a weird idea for me because this is an idea. It's rare that an idea that you work on overnight is adopted by millions of people. So this is kind of surreal this whole year and how this is adopted mainstream. And I think educators probably feel the same. They're like. All of a sudden, all my students are using generative AI. I would say that just the way that we measure learning is probably going to change to be more project oriented to what you do with tools rather than an outcome. You already see that a lot. At least universities have had to adapt particularly quickly because a lot of university computer science uh, courses are quite rigid. They've been from the 70s, basically. It's quite not much has changed, so a lot of it was very available. So you can see now this past like spot where the chatbot is generating the wrong answer, or we'll use this to create a project. So I expect that will happen. But I think perhaps just as interesting, I think it also unlocks the ability for people to iterate through ideas more frequently, which is one of the interesting aspects. The challenge is it puts a lot of burden on educators, and I don't think that can be denied because overnight they have to figure out how to adjust their goal marks. But I think the real exploitation part. Go ahead. Uh, I, I have two ideas there. One is I think it becomes an effective tool in education when the educators themselves find the use for it, not just to teach, but for the research and for some of the things that they like to do uh, or need to do in day to day life. Right? And so the companies that create these tools, if they can keep that in mind, that, you know, how. How can we provide examples of applications for educators? Because as you mentioned, time is limited, right? The other idea is already happening, which is AI is being programmed in a way that actually guides the student rather than just gives the student the answer. So it's not just about the product, it's about the process. How many of you have heard of uh, Conigo? Oh. Google that, right? Sign up for it. Because this is Khan Academy's implementation of AI. And, you know, I, I demoed it at a meeting the other day with my team. You can ask Khan Amigo to write you an essay, say, on Withering Heights. It won't. You can beg it to. You can say your assignment is due in five minutes. It won't, but it'll guide you through it. It'll ask you, oh, what was your favorite character? Um, you can ask Conigo to solve a chemistry problem for you. It won't do it. It'll ask you, well, what do you think the first step is? What about this problem? Where would you focus first? Right? So AI is changing dramatically so that this fear that educators might have about its use is going away, it's gonna go away because these tools can now be used by students in ways that are so effective for learning. And it's the great equalizer too. Because oftentimes in society, who can afford these personal tutors that can guide them through these subjects, right? It's only the wealthy who can afford this, right? Well now you have this this online tool that that everyone can have their own personal tutor. It's just amazing. Not many of you raised your hand when I mentioned it. Uh, I guarantee you won't regret uh, uh, playing with this tool uh, on Khan Academy called Khan Eagle. And you can see Salkan's uh, TEDx talk um, that we posted into the discussion um, on FYI, uh, where he talks about how AI can actually save education. It's a really interesting watch. Um, we do have a lot of questions to get through. We've got questions coming in from the audience, so thank you. Um, let's go 
um, on with the idea of interdisciplinary integration. You all have already talked about this. This is way beyond computer science and intersects with all different kinds of disciplines. We know that we're going to have to educate and train learners at different levels or tiers, and that different stakeholder groups are going to use it in different ways. Um, where do you see cross-disciplinary collaboration and helping students to really understand AI's real-world applications? And in addition, um, questions from the audience are coming in around how do we use this for art and media? How do we um, use this to support veterans that are, you know, coming back into the community and education settings? Um, and where do we think about the organizational changes and culture changes that are going to need to take place for all this to happen? I guess I'm closest to you, so I'll start. Sure. Uh, I, I, my entry point to a lot of this was science and math, but when I was in graduate school, I took a computational linguistics and NLP class, and it was like I had reached the final class of a video game, because finally I had, I could use all of this, you know, some people say boring math, to unlock the secrets of language, right? And I was always super interested in language. And I, I'm really interested to see how uh, this makes students really think deeply about language and kind of uh, access all parts of their linguistic registers, right? Like, how does this translate from, you know, say you know Spanish very well. Okay, how does it translate into English? Well, that's not the Spanish you use at home. So why is that? Or that's not the English that you use at home. So why is this like one dominant register being reflected in the repeated sampling of this large language model? And what does that tell us about society or how, how people interact or uh, uh, systems of power uh, in, in society, right? So I, I'm interested in all those conversations coming out, the kind of like what you would call like social linguistic conversations. Uh, that's probably what I'm most hyped up. And I'm excited about potential of programming into these, these applications, the ability to, to do interdisciplinary, right? Like I haven't, I haven't asked ChatGPT a question where it hasn't come back with an answer that is so specialized, right? But if ChatGPT could be programmed to think or to provide answers that are interdisciplinary, or to provide answers that are with a DEI lens, for example, or an ethical lens, right? Without the user having to know to do this. Right? These are things that uh, I see in the future of, of AI technology. You know, the, the next level. Okay. So that's largely where um, a lot of our focus is in terms of um, leveraging a virtual human conversation so that uh, the user can either be trained in very specific verbiage, uh, words to say, not to say. So it's uh, cross-cultural uh, business communications. So if you're working in a global business environment now, you, you, you want to come off in, in a way that's acceptable to the the person on the other side of the table or on the Zoom call or what have you. What are the customs of, of other cultures? We, you know, there's so many DEI and other uh, very critical types of conversations that AI can guide an individual user in a very personalized and adaptive way. So folks who are you know, really good in education uh, much longer than I have, understand where adaptive learning and deliberate practice, how, how, do we, how do we get folks a really personalized experience, whether they're a, a, an elementary school student or it's an individual at a corporation, that personalized and, and even adaptive or, or tuning of the experience is really very possible. And all the way down into a, uh, an experience that can train them in the interactions really foster those, um, uh, those compassion skills, those empathy skills, and, and things that just aren't really not very effectively trained in other ways. 
right, we can move on to the next uh, question here. I'm going to start going to your questions from the audience a little bit more specifically. Um, we talked a little bit about a tutor programs like Convigo. Uh, how can that help to improve individualized learning and what are your hopes and fears? personalization is now more feasible. So a lot of the shift that we've seen with this breakthrough is to move towards using large models, like the full foundation models or frontier models. And this is generally a switch from using small models for very specific things to using universal models that can do a lot of things. Chat GPT being one, other chat bots being another, where you can ask them anything, ranging from, like, tell me a summary of my men. Uh, to, you know, answer this question for me. Why that is promising for personalization is that when you start with a very large model, you don't have to add as much of data for it to uh, adapt to your downstream task. And what this means is this clearly pr promise for having private, data-specific personalization for different users. I think what's exciting about this is these cases like what you're describing, where education is a lot about personalization. How do you tailor something to a student? But it goes beyond that. You can think of personalization as also really powerful for just your conversation. It's like a chat about remembering what happened. So I think that is very exciting. I think it's something that uh, clearly where, where it's coming, and it's more about um, what I would also say it's exciting for is for what Joel's talking about, which is that these Chatbots largely serve English right now. I think about that a lot. Um, we have this massive open science multilingual project. Our goal is to cover 101 languages. Part of that was a grumpy project because I was so frustrated at how these our models are brittle. They basically represent what they're trained on. And if they're trained on the internet, it represents who uses the internet or historical usage. And there's this crazy statistic that sticks with me, which is 5% of households speak English but 67% of the internet is in English. Isn't that crazy? And that's why these models are primarily serving English. So there's things like that, where I think personalization, the ability to update these models using very small amounts of data is going to be critical also for areas where we don't have much data, where we don't have a lot of digital data where we can serve different communities. And I also ask, you know, it's, when you say English, it's like, who's English, right? And that's also a, a big question. In, in, in terms of the personalization paradigm, there's, you know, there's a lot about a student that you can encode in data structures that can be read by a computer, right? I can maybe form a graph of the concepts they've mastered, or I could form like a, a list of all the things that they've done before. But you know, the computer cannot tell whether or not that child has eaten that morning, right? The computer doesn't know the IEP. The computer doesn't know how much growth that child has shown throughout the year, whether or not their parents are going through a divorce, whether or not they're having a breakup with you know Susie across the room. So there's still so much that is irreplaceable about you know humans, not just teachers, but also paraprofessionals or any adults in a student's life uh, that are external. Uh, I hope that you know we can offload the personalization that can can occur from just knowing those things that can be included in those data structures and focus on you know building those relationships um, with the young people in classrooms. Let's follow that line of thought for just a minute, Joel. A couple follow-up questions. Um, do you worry about the social emotional learning of students, excuse me? And what age do you think they should be introduced to AI? Anybody else have thoughts? I mean, I, I'd say yes, we should all be worried or mindful of um, introducing it in any way. And I think that's the foundation from which we should operate. That there needs to be governance, there needs to be mindfulness about where it goes, where it doesn't go, about what the models are, how big are they, or how reduced and specific are they for the right reasons. Um, but if it's a choice of using AI to be really effective in educating kids 
that are would otherwise not have that type of access to a grander education, then yeah, use the use the AI, and because it's really uh, it's going to give them a better chance to move on to the next stage of education and so on. So yeah, yes, we need to be mindful, but I don't know what, what age, but I think it's it's inevitably a part of their you know those very first foundation skills. Okay. I, I think the question of age is an age-old question, right? Because we, we parents out there, you decide when your kid should get a cell phone, right? What age is that? You decide when your kid should get an iPad or start watching you know, streaming or TV, right? So it's different for every, every child, right? And I hope that, is there this is up your alley, the research on this, will help to inform us, right, about what uh, an appropriate age is, right? The, the technology is so new, but I hope that people are doing research out there. Yeah, I mean, I think this is the difference. So I build models, but the question of how tools are used is really also a societal question. I actually see different countries grappling with this in different ways, and even different households grappling with this in different ways. Um, I mean, I think in China, for example, children are prohibited from using more than a certain amount of hours of, of consumption of different devices. That's different from these type of tools, which are not a Netflix show or something like that. These are generative models, but of course, because they're so versatile, there's so many different use cases. I actually think it's... Uh, we're going to see a consensus around what we all view as like appropriate for um, different users of different ages. Like for example, I think that without human and the loop feedback, without a parent having visibility into what uh, children are occurring, I think it's the same as any type of internet access tool. Like I would be cautious. Um, but ultimately, I do agree. It's a question, particularly in the U.S. So I'm not American, so. Please correct me, but I think in the U.S. the approach is being household by household, like parents know best for their children. This is different from other societies. So the same way that the amount of time that people take for lunch is different from France. This is a societal question of how do we think about our relationship with technology. And that's often decided on a country by country basis. All right, we have some really high level questions and some really basic ones. So um, I'll, I'll share some of the, the task oriented one, let's say. Um, is, do you think that the data is being too centralized with current generative models? Uh, well, that's why I'm glad we have companies like Clovier pop up. Um, Kip, maybe you could say a little bit about, I'm gonna give you the assist here, you need to dump I, I mean, I think what Joel is referring to is that Cohere has large foundation models. So we, I would say there's a few aspects to this. So most foundation models are trained on the internet, and the internet is available. Um, this actually, I, I met uh, Joel Alves, I think a few weeks ago. He started Common Core when he quit Google, because so he still wanted the availability of the data afterwards. Common Core is kind of fascinating, because it's just out there on the internet. And until very recently, Five years ago, no one downloaded it. And then all of a sudden, it started to be used for pre-training these massive models. And now it's being downloaded all the time. So that type of data is out there. I think maybe what's being referred to is the data that comes after the pre-training on the internet. There's this very specific fine-tuning stage where you have very rich annotations, and you have data, and you fine-tune on that. That, I think, a lot of uh, different institutions spent a lot of time paying for those annotations and finding those annotations. And I would say there we have to think about ways to bridge the access gap the same way that we do with things like compute. So for example, the IO Multilingual Project that I mentioned that our lab is uh, supporting, we're releasing all that data back out to everyone involved because there's not much multilingual data out there. But I do think it's a valid question because the truth is these models are powerful for two reasons. One is the size, so the capacity to compute. That the other, and I shall say three, the second is the data. The quality of the data matters a lot. 
And so if you've invested a lot in high quality data, that's also a game changer. The third I would say is that building these models, training them, is still a very specialized skill set. And there's still very few places in the world that you can do it. And so the expertise. I hope that changes. I think a lot of people now build on top of these models, but I hope also we start to democratize some of the access so people can become engaged at all in the, the pipeline. But and, and I think that that's a really interesting research direction because as an engineer, uh, I'm not dealing with things on the scale of like a Cohere or Google or whatever. You know, these, these models take millions of dollars to train, you know, Imagine this room full of full of uh, specialized computers that um, process uh, tensors. So, but now you're starting to see uh, places like Meta release smaller models that can be trained on your M2 Airbook that you just got from the Apple Store. So, I think that's a really promising research direction. It's going to allow a lot more people to develop their fine-tuned kind of custom uh, generative models. I hope that these trainings, the language models are also training on the perspective of that culture of that language, right? Because, for example, uh, you know, a student in India might be taught British history a little differently than a student in the UK, right? And so one thing that we educators hear all the time from students is that they wish they had more teachers that look like them. And I hope that AI will start to provide answers that uh, are the analogy of looking like all students, not just students from, say, the Western Canada or you know, things like that. Uh, I mean, it's interesting. I think the principles are still the they kind of reflect us as we are, maybe not us as we hope we would be. I also think that it's a very interesting moment because this is the first type of algorithm that people in the public who maybe can't interact with algorithms before on their phone, but it's hidden kind of app, but this is the first time people have emotionally connected that interact with an algorithm. So I think that's promising because there's a lot of people who find failure points, which is the first step in figuring out where these models are broken. But the second thing is, I think what makes a lot of my research in the, in the past and presently a lot of focus is on is how do we mitigate some of these issues, like hallucinations, or bad distribution, like multilingual, where it's not performing well in other languages. A lot of what makes it promising is that at least with a biased uh, model, you can interrogate and you can figure out, is it performing well, is it not? And it's sometimes harder to do with a human because we're just more opaque. It's harder to sometimes figure out where exactly the bias is. But I would say, to be candid, these are one of the things that makes me nervous sometimes as a researcher is that these are research models which have been adopted overnight by millions of people. And so, to be totally candid, I actually think this is why this is such an open education question as well, and empowering users to, to really shape and call out and pinpoint where this technology is failing for them, because it, it, it is likely failing in many different ways. You know, and our lab focuses on many of them, but it's also empowering uh, users to say, it's not working, and what do we need to do to solve it? Yes. I Oh, sorry. Uh, in the late 90s, when Wikipedia first came out and it was like lawless, a lot of us were told never to trust Wikipedia references, right? And so I think now this will be kind of the new thing where we really have to tell our students and our young people to be critical of the output. So let's switch to input. Um, one of the questions is about what are best practices when asking questions or creating prompts in a generative model. Um, and is it learn by doing, or is there something that we should be educating people on, sort of basic AI literacy? How should we teach people and students to create prompts and ask good questions? Uh, I was thinking about this, right? So, one thing we need to show our students is that they can be better than the AI, right? The introduction that you had, Chad, 
GPT do, right? It's a very personal thing. It was a personal thing for me. And when AI generates writing that is personal for students, I guarantee you that you could guide a student to, to, to improve that AI-generated output, right? And through that, uh, the student can learn how to provide better inputs. I'll tell you another story. Uh, in LMU, I was talking to our admissions folks, right? And I was asking them, are you worried that most of your uh, personal essays this year are going to be AI generated? And they said, absolutely not. Because for years, we have been spotting BS right, in admissions essays. That's not going to change with AI. Right? So we can still teach students how to be critical of the output that AI generates. We can teach them that. And in, in doing so, they will learn to provide better inputs that will help them to get better outputs, right? You have something? Thank you. Just remind everyone, so prompts are kind of a weird way of like probing a model, but there's no science to prompts. I mean, it's very interesting. If you ever spent too much time optimizing your prompts for one generation of model, if you've ever had that experience and then the model gets upgraded and none of your favorite prompts work well again on the next generation, because it's a high dimensional space and every time it's optimized separately, so I would just have fun with it. I think that it's an explore, it's a way to explore and probe a model. And I, I think people who focus too much on the most optimized, this happened a lot when Stable Diffusion came out, and people had their favorite version of Stable Diffusion, and they would create these super long, precise prompts about this type of artist, and then this type of artist, and then, and as soon as the next version came out, all of them failed, because it was a model that was trained in a different stochastic process, and so it can't be optimized. I think that prompt engineering is going to be important. It's going to be a way to facilitate different types of tasks, but it's not a science yet, so you can't really go wrong. You just have to explore and see what works for you. And I think too is like an iterative process, right? Like if you don't like the output, just tell it to revise it in some way. If you don't like that, tell it to revise it that way. You're going to get much better results out of that than like I said, sitting there trying to optimize the best prompt. So, so you're still using critical thinking and responding and then continuing to interact it, it, with the model. I mean, if, if there's less science behind it, perhaps, then that leads to more creativity behind it. If you're more creative with it, then, you know, maybe those are better results on a consistent basis because you're flexing those creative muscles. And that ideally is not going to change over time. It doesn't matter what, when, the, when there's an update, when everything's optimized, you're still thinking creatively and hopefully getting good out. I want to say something here because a good friend of mine, David Hyde, he was a colleague of mine at Google Brain. He was saying something to me. He was at Stable Diffusion. He's now gone on to do another company. He was saying, you know, the most creative images that people generated was when they were using DALI. <laughs> and it made me laugh because anyone who's used DALI, it's like really clunky. It generates weird shapes. It's not like there's no faces, there's no hands. He said because when image generation became too realistic, People just generated food and random stuff and motorcycles, and it's like they couldn't be creative again. And he said that if you learn DALI to overcome the limitations of the algorithm, people really pushed it out there, created really weird and creative landscapes. So there's something that happens to us when technology is too good. It reduces the friction so much that we it dampens our creativity, which is kind of interesting to think about. All right, uh, we have questions about pay to play, should it stay open source, should it be free, 
let's talk about accessibility and cost, and specifically there's concern about the ability for the FANG companies to dominate AI because of their massive data sets and sort of turn the direction of the whole environment. How might that interplay with education? Uh, well, it's going to be expensive for school districts. Um, I think that you know, Stanford has the right idea in that you know, they're trying to build a lot of these models and infrastructure themselves. The main problem is you know, if I want to create my own thing, there has to be a GPU somewhere running my model. And it's usually not one GPU, it's usually a bunch of GPUs. And so some of these machines, I, I don't know, like, what are they, like 30 Gs, 40 Gs, or a NVIDIA something, something. Um, they're very expensive. And so it doesn't even make sense for individual organizations to have their own. And so what do you do? You go on AWS and you rent their machines. Um, so all the way down, you're paying one of the big companies. Uh, and I definitely think that this is a problem and I have zero solutions for it. But everyone should know about it. I think it's different settings. So Kohia, for example, is a foundation model company. Uh, I run Kohia's research lab, so Kohia hosts models. I'd say it's also really important for an open source uh, environment. So for example, our research lab is releasing this I multilingual model. We release other things. The two are not necessarily the same use case. When people want to have a hosted model that they use an API for, typically it's a business that has latency requirements that needs to query at scale. When someone wants to play with a model that's open source, it might be someone who just wants to, you know, play with it, fine tune it, a lower scale. So enterprise use cases are very different from individual use cases, and it's important we have an ecosystem that fits both. Typically people switch to hosted models when they have a lot of traffic and they need to guarantee that uh, the API calls go through with a certain latency requirement. It, both are good for the ecosystem in different ways. And I think that open source also allows for a lot of research progress. One of the reasons that we've seen so much progress in the last decade, like going before NLP, the computer vision, is because open source, there was all these researchers and systems on open source, uh, even while I was there, it was all open source. And that's because uh, so much was built on what was released, and that's been the case here now. I think there's a counter trend now where people are being more closed, and that's unfortunate. Um, I think we're still trying to keep the balance where we have a research lab that's external facing and releasing work, as well as uh, foundation models that enterprise use. You should definitely be free. <laughs> but, you know, we have, we have examples, right? The internet. That was something that society decided should be free, right? And you know, I know that it has, you know people have to make a living, right? But I, I do urge the major companies investing in this to remember the arguments that they have made in the last year about how this is going to change uh, access and level the playing field, right? Uh, you know, for the first time, this, this technology can really be a game changer for, for example, uh, disabled people, right? Uh, there's a technology in that room over there, uh, Devon Systems, that is being demoed, where you don't have to be an amazing artist to create great art. You just have to have an idea. And you can, you can use a little finger or your knuckle or even your nose to, to shape something. And then the art will take a guess at what you wanted to create and then you can use other inputs to refine it. Right? That's a game changer for some people. And, and, and I hope that you know, we, will, uh, we will have a commitment to this type of social justice to provide these tools, right? I don't have the perfect answer for how we would fund it, but you know, that, that's my plea. We have some questions about the workforce and using AI tools um, to replace basic tasks um, and a 
eventually eliminating or shifting and changing jobs and roles and what they look like. Um, how do we help educate in sort of this, the spectrum of AI literacy that when you use these tools and you might be shifting and changing your job, how do we support the workforce in that way and thinking about it? I think I can jump in a little bit on that one. So, um, <clears throat> the change in, 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 pardon me, sorry, the sort of workforce shift and the need to reskill or upskill a million, a, a over a billion people was well before ChatGPT hit the news at the end of last year. There's been trends in workforce shifts coming for a couple of decades. And, and so I think where AI comes in is, is actually probably to help us get ahead of it. Um, yes, there, there are going to be certain job roles that will go away, but others will be created. And ideally, ideally, I think they are ideal, but with for thought and governance and uh, moderation, we can uh, we, we can uh, use the technology to do the things that humans don't really want to do, that don't give them purpose, that don't satisfy them, that essentially is something that's so democratized that they're not being paid a fair wage for it anyway. So now that's not it. That's not a panacea. Not by any stretch. But there are just a lot of roles that um, will be then further created based on AI taking on some tasks. So just what does that free up the human race, who is the only animal with this brain, with this level of consciousness and cognitive ability? What, what can we do then if we're not stuck in rope tasks that are maybe more mundane and not really all that exciting. So uh, I think it's, it's all over the workforce. I think it's, um, it's in some places it's gonna be ugly and unfortunate, but uh, I think it's, a, it's also a, a welcome, in many ways, it's going to be a welcome change uh, from, I don't wanna say progress, it's too generic, but, I, th I think a much needed change for a workforce that is struggling. All right, we're coming up to the end of our time together, but we're going to end with this question from Roman. I'm just going to read it the way he wrote it. With the combination of economic trouble, rising uncertainty about the future, easier access to knowledge through the internet, and new AI educational tools, will higher education be able to survive? Is the traditional college model sinking ship? <laughs> Education will survive. <laughs> and here's why. Okay? Because when AI realizes its full potential, right? When you don't have to be an artist to be able to draw, when you don't have to be an animator to create an animation or a film, right? You don't have to be a filmmaker to create a film, right? As, as you were speaking to, what will you need to be able to do? You will need to be able to be creative. You will need, and to be creative, you will have to draw from different disciplines that you receive in an education, right? I, I worry about specialization just for the sake of training folks to, to do AI, whatever that means. Because AI will realize its full potential. Uh, your company, uh, I saw, does non-programming programming, right? You can program your, your uh, uh, virtual human conversation. Yeah, virtual human conversation. Yeah, no code. No code, right? So there will be a day when you don't have to know code to create something, right? In my mind, I have the next Tetris, the next Snood, right? I have something in my mind for that. I don't know how to program a lick. But when, but when there's no code programming through AI, then I'm gonna create that game, right? And make a lot of money. And give it all. 
So I don't think uh, education is going to go by the wayside. We will still need those critical thinking skills. We will still need that breadth of knowledge that almost all universities and colleges require of their students, right? Those core curricula. Because that's what feeds our creative process, uh, especially in the fields that we value a lot in society. That's all. Uh, I, I got a quote, one of my favorite scenes of all time, uh, Aja Eaton. And she's, uh, when she first went to college at uh, UC Irvine, she posts on Instagram, college is just a bunch of book clubs. And she was completely right, because it is just a bunch of book clubs, but it's the best book club around, right? Sometimes that book is Bishop Pattern Recognition and Machine Learning. Sometimes the book is Bell Hooks or Paulo Ferreri, but it's like, the thing is, you're in the space. And I think a lot of us during uh, you know, the Zoom classroom era really started to realize just how magical the process of learning in school in person is, how multimodal it is. You know, you're, you're hearing, you're unfortunately smelling sometimes, you're, uh, you're getting up, you're moving around, you're making human connections. There's words all around you and in, in, in patterns that you could never take in through a two-dimensional representation of three-dimensional space on your computer screen. Uh, and so, so long as, as, as those things exist, and um, you, know, you have artifacts of learning, like you're in place, you're building a rocket, right? Uh, you're, you're making a painting. That will never be replaced by a, a model that spits symbols out, uh, or, or even a you know, Zoom screen. I completely agree. Well said. Any last thoughts that you want to share with the audience? Um, I think this was fun. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, thank you for being an amazing moderator as well. Thank you. Thank you all for being here with us. We're all going to be here, and the discussion continues to go on on FYI. So if you're not in the discussion on the app yet, please jump in there. You can reply to each other. You can ask us questions. We'll also jump in um, and carry the conversation forward. I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. Thanks for us again for our amazing panel and moderator. I just want to let you know, for anybody who's interested in learning more about FYI, we have that big screen over there in a booth where we will be showing you more about the product and how it works and how you can use it to communicate and organize and work on creative projects. So come see us over there at the booth. Thank you all so much for coming out. I'm going to pass the mic over to Todd from AIA. Thanks for Todd!